Thank you very much, Sharon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to talk to you tonight about some of the exciting things that have been happening in stroke. I've titled it Preventable, Treatable, Beatable, which is a slogan we borrowed from one of our sister organisations internationally. But Sharon's talked a little bit about the prevention, blood pressure and all the other lifestyle factors that we can deal with. I'm going to focus at the moment on treatable and uh, beatable we can talk about later. Sharon mentioned that uh, stroke remains one of our huge health problems and that one in six of us will have a stroke, which pretty much means every one of us has someone in our family that has had a stroke and been affected by it. 80% of strokes caused by a blocked blood vessel and the treatments are to open that blocked blood vessel. I don't need to tell this audience that there are two types of stroke, but I'm going to focus tonight on the blocked blood vessel type of stroke, bearing in mind that hemorrhages, bleeds in the brain, are equally represented in mortality from stroke and it's an area where we still need to do a lot more work. So why does that clot happen? Well, Commonly, we get clots forming in the carotid artery in the neck. That's one common place where cholesterol plaque builds up. And when people are measuring your cholesterol, that's what they're really trying to do. Make sure that that kind of fatty stuff is not accumulating in the lining of your artery. The other thing that can happen is atrial fibrillation. This is an epidemic in our society as people get older. They survive their heart attacks and, and live on with damaged hearts that can develop atrial fibrillation later on in life. Um, over the age of 80, atrial fibrillation is probably the major cause of uh, big strokes that we see. And the problem with it is it's tricky. It comes and goes. So just because your GP's checked you yesterday and you haven't got it doesn't mean that you can flip into it and then have a stroke in the next few days. So it is one of the causes of stroke that we need to detect better. This is a slide I made at the beginning of my PhD and I, I like to show it because it illustrates what happens when you have a stroke. If a little clot goes up, in this case our middle cerebral artery, not that that really matters, there's some tissue that doesn't have alternative sources of blood supply. And that deep area there is going to die if we block the blood supply to it, no matter what we do in a few minutes. But there's a large area of the brain in many people that has alternative sources of blood supply. And so instead of coming through the usual passage, it can circulate over the surface of the brain and find its way into that other area of the brain, which we call penumbra. It's a technical term for hibernating brain, if you like, brain that we can save if we get the artery open quickly. And unfortunately, over time, what happens is that those alternative blood pressure, uh, blood pathways fail and uh, the stroke enlarges. And the patient to us at the end of the bed looks the same. The tissue is not functioning, whether it's hibernating or dead, but uh, by this stage we've lost the opportunity to do anything. And this happens over the first few hours. So the key for us to making the diagnosis of a stroke is firstly to look at the patient clinically. Sometimes it's pretty obvious when they can't move one side, can't talk, uh, looking off into space, ignoring the person standing right next to them. But uh, brain imaging is really key to us being able to understand what sort of stroke it is. It doesn't take too much to know that that big lump of white stuff there is a bleed. Uh, it's obvious, it's immediately apparent. Blocked vessels are a little more subtle. Sometimes we can see a little thing like that that's a blocked artery. Uh, sometimes it's even more subtle, like that little dot there. And sometimes we can detect there's a subtle difference in the uh, grey matter differentiation on one side compared to the other. These are subtle signs. They're hard to pick. And we often end up saying, it looks like a stroke clinically, and here's no blood on the CT scan. We're going to assume it's a blocked vessel and treat as such. And that's the way thrombolysis, which is the clot-busting drug, was developed. It's on the assumption that someone who looks like they've got a stroke and no blood must have a blocked blood vessel somewhere. Fortunately, these days we can do something a bit more advanced, brain scans that show you where the blood flow is abnormal. And this is a patient here where there's a large area of abnormal delayed blood flow, which is the hibernating brain, and a very small area of severely reduced blood flow, which is going to be the dead brain. So I can tell that this patient, although they can't move their right hand side, can't talk, can't understand, paying no attention to the right side of space, if we can get that artery open quickly, they'll get back to a very good state of function and probably go home in a few days. We have automated software that can tell us roughly what the volumes of dead tissue and salvageable tissue are, which is very helpful when we're making decisions about the potential benefit of therapy. So we're now in a position not just to assume it's a stroke, but to actually visualise that it is a stroke and where the blocked vessel is and what implications that has for the downstream tissue. This is all the stuff we can do for stroke. Sharon <coughs> mentioned stroke unit care. It is the platform on which everything else is built. And it in itself reduces death and disability um, with the number needed to treat of 28. That means 28 people put in a stroke unit, one of them's going to get back to independent function that otherwise wouldn't. So that's pretty powerful for something that's really just about organising the way we do stroke care. We have TPA, the clot busting drug, uh, number needed to treat somewhere between 7 and 15. I've been conservative on this slide. But basically, if it opens the artery, it will improve the outcome. It doesn't always do that. And that's why we have thrombectomy, which is what I'm mainly going to talk about tonight. 
We know that the clot busting doesn't work as well in people with a large blocked artery, and so going in and physically removing the clot has become uh, the way to go with this population. I'm going to talk about these trials that changed the face of stroke last year. Aspirin's a very simple thing that we can do for a lot of people, but you need to lead a tr treat a lot of people to make a difference as well. And hemicraniectomy is a, a neurosurgical procedure really for a very small targeted group of patients where you remove a large flap of bone from the skull to allow the brain that's been injured to swell outwards rather than pushing down on the vital brain stem and killing the patient. And that may only need to treat two patients to save a life, but we might do 10 or 12 at the Royal Melbourne Hospital a year. So it's small bickies in overall effect. Intracerebral hemorrhage, we're really a bit therapeutically destitute. We can put people in a stroke unit, that works. We can lower their blood pressure intensively, that probably helps a little bit, but we really do need some new treatments to help with the bleeding in the brain. So I'm going to talk about endovascular therapy. This is what we colloquially refer to as a fishing shot. This is the uh, solitaire stent that's been pulled out with clot intact. Um, that one is at least a six pounder. Um, now this treatment's been around for quite a while. Uh, in 2013, lead, years leading up to that, there was a lot of hype. I learnt when I was in France on the weekend about the someone Gartner hype cycle. Some of you would be more familiar with it than I am. And there's this uh, initial hype, and then you go through a trough of disillusionment, and then you recover and get onto the uh, the plateau of productivity or something like that. Um, so I'm hoping that this was the trough of disillusionment back in 2013, that we're now back on the upswing. Uh, basically, there were three trials of pulling clots out that didn't show a benefit over standard clot busting therapy. And that was for a number of reasons. Partly, their devices weren't particularly effective. They only got the artery open about 40% of the time. It took a bit too long to treat patients. We know time is brain again and again. And uh, they also had some problems with investigator, what we call equipoise, the willingness of investigator to put someone in a trial because they think they know the treatment works. And that's a big problem in medicine. We have to have a degree of confidence in what we're doing in order to have the guts to treat patients. But on the other hand, we also need to understand our limitations and our uncertainties. And when that goes awry, we have people not putting the younger patient with great brain imaging in the study because they know that the treatment works. And then you end up with a lot of crumbly patients that don't show the treatment works. So we have that issue. Um, this is the device that changed things. It's called a stent retriever, which means it's a cage on a stick that you can drop into the clot. This is done by interventional neuroradiologists. They allow it to sit there for a few minutes to incorporate the clot, and then you pull it out under negative pressure suction. So it was a new way of doing it, and it really did change the game. This is Peter Mitchell and I. Peter's the neuroradiologist at Royal Melbourne who heads up the statewide service and pulls these clots out. And uh, this is the, the rest of the team that were involved with foundation funding, amongst other places. And this is the paper we produced. So uh, this is the New England Journal of Medicine, which we all like to publish in if we can. It's a, it's a good journal to be in. So what was the different about our trial compared to the ones that didn't work? Well, we gave everyone the clot-busting drug. We made sure they had a large vessel occlusion. That was one of the issues with the previous trials is they didn't do the imaging to make sure there was actually a target for therapy. And we used our special perfusion imaging to make sure there was brain to save. We didn't restrict age limit, so um, you could be 90 and get into the trial, uh, but we did require people who were premorbidly independent. We didn't restrict the clinical severity, and uh, this is what happened. Uh, graphs. Some people love, some people don't. Basically what this is, is how much blood flow was restored to the brain. And you can see with the standard clot dissolving drug, there was a lot of variation. This is zero, this is 100%. The average was around 37%. So it opens the artery about a third of the time, you could say. With the clot retrieval treatment, the vast majority of people had complete opening of the artery at 24 hours with a few outliers, some of whom didn't actually get the treatment. So that was very powerful. We also looked at how the patients responded neurologically. When we come back and look at them the next day, still, do they still have the weakness and numbness and visual and speech problems that they had? And again, you can see that they were pretty similar at baseline, but this group here that got the treatment had dramatically lower scores, as in better neurological outcome, no matter whether you look at 24 hours, 3 days or 90 days. So it certainly improved the neurological scores, and then what we of course worry about is, well, what about functional recovery? So. This is another way of looking at functional recovery. This is all what our stroke trials look like if you ever read a stroke paper. So zero is a normal patient, six is a dead patient, and then there's varying degrees of disability in between. So you've got ones and twos who have independence but might have some symptoms at one or some loss of activities like not driving or working or playing golf anymore uh, at two. Three, they need help with some activities like shopping, cleaning, cooking. Uh, four, they need help with dressing, showering, um, and feeding themselves. 
and five, they need full-time nursing care. So it's a very practical, pragmatic scale about how people are functioning after stroke. And obviously we want to see more people down this end than up this end. And that's entirely what happened in this trial. You can see that the number of people achieving independent function was 71% at three months versus 40% with our standard treatment. So for every three patients we treat, someone else is independent who wouldn't otherwise have been. And that is one of the most powerful effects in any area of medicine. If you think about heart attacks, we get all excited about opening up the artery and heart attack. You need to treat 29 patients to save a life or improve someone's outcome. So this is incredibly powerful stuff. Now, I think we have a video here. And this is one of our Extend IA patients who's going to talk about his experience with stroke. It was hard to, to believe that I had a stroke. I, I didn't think it would happen to me, actually. So when Sam came to the hospital, he had a very severe stroke. He couldn't move his right arm at all. He couldn't talk and he couldn't understand what we were saying to him. He couldn't look out to, or he couldn't see anything in his um, right half of his vision. So this is the brain imaging we took when you first came to the hospital. And you can see there's an abnormal area of blood flow. This is actually the left side of the brain, controls the right side of your body. So that's why he couldn't move the right hand side, why he couldn't talk when you came in. And that's just showing you that the next day when we repeated the scan, that blood flow had all gone back to normal. So Sam was one of the lucky ones who got the treatment and uh, you can see what a difference it made. He went from completely paralysed down one side, unable to talk, to sitting there having a nice conversation with me, and uh, that was his normal degree of verbal fluency. So um, basically there were five trials last year that all established that uh, this treatment was very effective. Um, there was our Australian one, there was a Canadian one, there was a US one, there was a European one from the Netherlands which started it all off. So it's, it's, it's you know, very unusual in medicine to have five trials all showing the same thing and the degree of consistency between the results was very impressive. Um, we've now got those five trials in a collaboration together and we've managed to pull the results which was recently published this year in The Lancet. And basically there are those bars again that I like showing, uh, but you can see there that the number of patients down this end of the chart when they get intervention is much higher. Um, it doesn't have a huge effect on mortality, but that does depend on what group of patients you uh, treat. And if you're treating patients over the age of 80, it does actually significantly reduce death uh, and doesn't leave them disabled. So uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to die from stroke, and we can make a big difference with that. Where can the interventionists get to? This is an angiogram. This is what happens when you inject dye into an artery. It looks like this, hopefully. Um, this is the carotid artery. That's fair game. This first part of the middle cerebral artery is fair game, just up to here. And then it starts getting a bit small and tortuous for the current devices. So at the moment, that's the limit. And beyond that, we use just the clot-busting drug. But perhaps with evolution in technology, that will change and we'll be able to send the interventionists fishing a bit further out. I mentioned that age should be no barrier. And this is just a nice demonstration visually of what happens as you get older. In the quality of recovery is on the left, so good recovery up the top, poor recovery down the bottom. You can see as you get older, your chance of a good recovery is lower, but they're still parallel lines. So if you treat them, they do just as much better than if you leave them alone, untreated. And I think that's a really important message for us as clinicians and also for patients, because ageism is very prevalent in our society, not just in neurology. And uh, there have been even uh, indication labels in the, in the official labels of drugs like TPA in Europe, they haven't been giving it to people over the age of 80 um, because of worse outcomes, but they forget that that's a difference between treatment effect, where you might still benefit and do better than you otherwise would. Same with severity. So on the on the uh, y-axis, the up and down, you've got good outcome again. And on the, on the x-axis, you've got increasing stroke severity. And again, it doesn't matter if you're very mild or very severe. You do better if you get treated than if you don't. And so what it all comes down to now is implementation. The guidelines have changed internationally. Uh, so in the US, in Europe, and in Canada, the guidelines have already changed and recommend this. In Australia, we're currently revising the guidelines. Uh, that's a Stroke Foundation-led activity funded by the federal government. So we are, we are revising our guidelines and we are changing the systems uh, by which we deliver patients. And Sharon mentioned the FAST message. It's absolutely critical for any of this to work that patients recognise that they're having a stroke and call an ambulance. Uh, we don't want people arriving in private cars. It doesn't allow us to prepare for their arrival and it could be dangerous for them. So we really want ambulance uh, to be called as soon as someone recognises a stroke. 
Stroke in and access is something Sharon also talked about. This is the situation in 2010 across Victoria. Uh, and you can see that there were four centres outside Melbourne that were able to give the clot busting drug and a few others that had stroke units. And really that left a large proportion of our population uncovered when it came to clot busting drugs, let alone clot retrieval. Victorian Stroke Telemedicine Program has changed that. Basically, it's a bunch of doctors in Melbourne who carry around laptops. Um, I often have to take a call in some interesting place and you pull out the laptop and fire up the Wi-Fi wi modem and, and have a look at someone who's in Horsham or Wangaratta or some other far-flung place and give some advice on what should be treated. So with the advent of those, we now have these little red dots covering around 95% of the population within a 60-minute drive time to a clot-busting centre and uh, we can bring them down to Melbourne for endovascular clot retrieval uh, in the vast majority of cases. Melbourne's very fortunately served by a lot of TPA centres. You can't go too far without finding one and uh, you can certainly get clot retrieval very quickly in Melbourne. So Victoria, I can see some of our representatives from the Department of Health here, um, has been very forthright in developing a statewide protocol. We've got two designated centres for clot retrieval. We've got the telemedicine system. We've got uh, imaging that's been upgraded to allow this to all happen. And really, you know, Victoria's in a good situation. We want Victoria to show the way for other states. Uh, because we really do need to make this a nationwide thing. The other area where the Stroke Foundation's been involved is in the OSDAT tool, which I don't think I've heard mentioned tonight, but that's basically a stroke registry, a database, if you like, looking at the, the characteristics of people who have stroke and also their outcomes after stroke. And in Victoria, we're going to use this to monitor the quality and rate of the clot retrieval procedures, which is quite an unfamiliar thing for a health department to do in Australia. Um, we'll have an expert committee who are actually looking at how often people are getting the treatment, are there bottlenecks in the system delaying treatment, and how effective is it being. So that's all made possible by having the OSDAT registry. Obviously, this is a national organisation and Victoria is doing well, but we need to make all these advancements national. Queensland is a big challenge, as is Western Australia and other places. We're pretty much the easiest state to manage in Victoria. Um, this is a slide I show the Americans because uh, it shows that um, Queensland's two and a half size, times the size of Texas, which makes it very obvious to them that it's a big problem, that we have all our neurointerventional workforce concentrated down in the bottom right there, and uh, there's no telemedicine at this stage, so we've got some work to do in other states. I thought I'd finish off with a case example of someone who did get transferred from a rural uh, site. This is a 70-year-old guy. Um, I was on for tele stroke, and I was called at... Uh, what was it, 57 minutes past midnight, um, to uh, have a look at him. He had severe left side of weakness and slurred speech. It'd take an, almost an hour to drive him from his home to the hospital because he was uh, way out um, past Cobram. And uh, his CT scan uh, didn't show any hemorrhage. They called me. We gave him the clot-busting drug shortly afterwards. And uh, then we had to work out if we could get him down to Melbourne. And so in this case, uh, fixed wing uh, was the way to go. We have to always toss up, do you drive them, do you helicopter them, do you fixed wing them? And uh, he got down to Melbourne. Uh, so that was his initial scan. I was able to see that there was this blocked artery here, fairly subtle, but it was uh, clear cut from our point of view that he had a big blocked artery. Um, when he got down to Melbourne, we re-imaged him and we showed that uh, the stroke hadn't progressed too much and he had a big blocked artery. So, um, in fact, it was much worse than we thought because the artery was blocked down here in his neck, not just up in the skull. These days, this was the first case that got transferred uh, before they were doing this kind of imaging up in the country. Now we'd know this before they even got transferred. Um, we did our fancy perfusion imaging and showed that there wasn't a lot of dead brain except deep down here. And so one of the guys, it was Rick Dowling in this case, went in, had to put a stent in his carotid down in the neck to be able to open that up, and then they opened up the artery in the brain. So this was all now at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's a long time down the road, and that's something that we are working on, trying to tighten up the system to make this uh, faster. He had almost complete restoration of blood flow. This little bit of the brain here died because it didn't get complete restoration, and that was the bit that was dead already. But a few months later, there he is chirping, uh, chatting to me on the, on the telemedicine system again. So, um, you know, you can get good outcomes from country patients even when it does take a while, and as we get better, it will take less time. It's good to, good to see these guys a few months later doing well. So what's the future? Well, really for us, we think the next frontier is the pre-hospital space. Uh, we're now at a point at good centres where you can deliver the clot busting therapy within half an hour, sometimes within 10 minutes of arriving at the door. And that means that most of the onset to treatment time is before the patient even arrives in hospital. 
There's this concept of a mobile stroke treatment unit, which is basically an ambulance equipped with a CT scanner and someone expert in stroke. And uh, we can commence the clot busting treatment in the field. And then if we've identified someone with a big vessel occlusion, we can take them directly to the angiogram without even touching base with the emergency department. So these things exist internationally. This is the Cleveland Clinic one, big truck as they had to have in America. Uh, this is the German version, which is probably a bit more like we'll get here in Melbourne, a little sprinter ambulance like our standard ambulances. And they've all got this little CT scanner in it uh, to identify what the brain looks like. You can see blood very easily. You can see uh, the absence of blood in a, an, an early stroke there, and you can see a blocked artery with the CT angiogram. So it really gives us a lot of the information we get in the emergency department outside the patient's door. Very exciting stuff. We're hoping to kick off in January next year with Australia's first um, mobile stroke treatment unit. So stroke, as I hope I've convinced you, is a massive health problem for us at the moment. It would be lovely if we could get it down to number 50 on the priority list, but at the moment it's right up there. Uh, major cause of disability. We need everyone. And I want you to go home and swat your nearest and dearest with that fast message. It's very important that uh, no one you know is ignorant about that. The systems of care and the treatments are evolving rapidly. The last 12 months has really been transformative for outcomes, and Australian researchers are leading the way. Um, it's preventable, it's treatable, it's beatable, but we do need your help to continue advancing care. And with that, I'll leave you with that message to ingrain it on your retina. I'm delighted to take any questions that you've got.